moderators. And uh, we are both faculty in the Rossier MAT TESOL program at the University of Southern California. And we are super excited to offer you these online webinars that we call masterclasses as uh, professional learning opportunities for a wider audience, uh, people other than just our students. So it looks like we have 73 people in the room and uh, your students, alumni, faculty, professionals in the field, and the friends of our MIT TESOL program. So welcome all. So we have two hours today, and during these hours, we'll hear a talk by Dr. Stephen Kroshen, and we will then open um, the floor for questions and answers. And so at this time, I'm going to turn the floor to Dr. Rob Fieldback. Great, thank you, Katya. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Stephen Krashen. Pro uh, Professor Krashen is of course already very well known to most of you, I imagine in the audience. You have likely read his work. Uh, many of you use his approaches and strategies in your classrooms. Um, Dr. Krashen's long and illustrious career is obviously very impressive, um, but I think what's even more interesting and impressive is how it can be an inspiring model for all of us. Uh, and I, I, I just want to say a few things about uh, Dr. Krashen. Uh, Dr. Krashen completed his PhD in linguistics at UCLA. He's currently an emeritus professor of education here at the University of Southern California. Uh, he's the author of well over 500 articles and books, uh, imagine that. And he's also, perhaps more importantly, a prolific author on Twitter. So if you haven't followed Dr. Krashen already on Twitter, I encourage you to do that. Uh, to, to stay up with uh, his latest work and follow um, his thinking. He's written across a number of fields, bilingual education, neurolinguistics, second language acquisition, literacy, uh, just some of the well-known concepts that Dr. Krashen has contributed to the field uh, that most of you will recognize include things like the distinction between acquisition and learning, the importance of optimal input, uh, the critical importance of free voluntary reading, for his, for his work, Dr. Krashen has received numerous awards, uh, everything from the Dorothy McKenzie Award for his distinguished contribution to the fields of field of children's literature, uh, to just last year receiving the Kenneth S. Goodman in Defense of Good Teaching Award from the College of Education at the University of Arizona. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Krashen, though, I want to say one more thing. Uh, tonight, Dr. Krashen is going to be talking to us about writing. We as a faculty here in the MAT TESOL program have had the good fortune of having Professor Krashen take time to mentor us, especially in the area of research and writing. I want, to know, I want you to know that one of the uh, principles that uh, Dr. Krashen promotes in his writing, which you may be talking to about, about tonight, is about writing for free and letting our work be out there in the world for free through open source journals and websites. And tonight is really an example of this principle in practice. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm certain Dr. Krashen can command impressive stipends and honoraria for all types of speaking engagements, uh, including major keynotes. But tonight, Dr. Krashen is here offering his time freely. And, and Dr. Krashen, we really want to thank you for your generosity to do this for free. We know your passion is about helping students and teachers, ensuring that they have what they need to be great professionals, uh, to be successful in their work. So we really want to thank you for your time tonight. Uh, so with that, uh, we will turn it over to Dr. Krashen. Well, I have several criticisms of your introduction. Fair enough. Great way to begin. First of all, I get very uncomfortable with Dr. Krashen. Okay. Because my son is the real Dr. Krashen. He's on the phone right now with my wife. Oh my gosh. And he's the real Professor Krashen. He's okay. a professor of mathematics. Can you imagine that? Children succeed where their parents fail. Um, the, the other thing is about doing things for free. Uh, that I have a very selfish motivation there. Nobody has any money. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed. Oh, that's true. It's getting a lot worse. It's either that or you don't work at all and you're no longer part of the profession. And also, my other selfish reason for this is that I cannot afford books and journals anymore. And neither can any of the people listening. I don't know what's going on. So we've got to start somewhere with this. I'll tell you where it all happened. I'm a true believer in what Alice Roosevelt said. If you don't have anything good to say about somebody, sit next to me. 
So here come the criticisms. Uh, about uh, 15 years ago, I was invited to contribute an article in a collection that was called Input Matters, Multilingual Matters Did It. And uh, I really had a good time with the article. It was the last long article I ever wrote. Uh, I talked about comprehensible input, language acquisition, literacy, whole language, all the good stuff. I even had a section on animal language, speculating whether when animals acquire human language or each other's codes, is it through comprehensible input? And the answer is a kind of maybe it is. And I even had a long footnote on what to expect when the aliens finally land from Zeta Reticula. Some people say they're already here, by the way. Uh, they come in the form of mushrooms. And if you uh, want to communicate with them, eat one, and they'll talk to you. Well, it's, a, it's a brilliant hypothesis. Uh, anyway, I love that paper. I had such a good time. The book came out, and this is like 2008, hardcover, 165 American dollars. I couldn't, if I, I couldn't afford to buy extra copies at, copies at author discount. In fact, I had to fight the publisher to get my two free copies. They only wanted to give me one. I want to buy copies for my cousins. It's really fun. Uh, so I then looked at the website for Multilingual Matters. I'm telling you, no, Mr. Nice Guy today. And they're charging that for all their books. There was a book called Poverty and Education, $160. The irony was lost on them completely. Uh, I deduct what I do for journals, a Schedule C, as some of us do. I can't afford it. It's thousands of dollars every year. And I also noticed that I can't get through the literature anymore. I probably have as much background knowledge as anybody in the field. I'm a pretty good reader. I don't move my lips when I read and all that. And I know this stuff. I don't have time to get through it. The articles are much too long. People are publishing their dissertations as journal papers. One of my favorite papers was the paper on the double helix. Crick and Watson, probably one of the most cited papers of all time, Nobel Prize winning, okay? They beat Linus Pauling to the race for the double helix. He wrote them this great letter of congratulations. He said, I read your article and it was so exciting. Good work, guys, and all that. Now that's a good loser, it's wonderful. Uh, anyway. The Double Helix article, which appeared in the journal Nature, was two pages. The discussion at the end was, it has not escaped our notice that our hypothesis might provide a mechanism for this and that and the other. That was it. So this one was a model for me. Short papers, make them free, open access, free to the reader, free to the writer, free for everyone. I feel like I'm following the lead of um, Bernie Sanders that this stuff, like higher education, like all education, it's good for society, should be absolutely free of charge. And it's only a matter of time, if we keep doing this, that everyone will be doing it, that you can do these short papers and they're evaluated favorably for tenure and promotion. That's the goal. So I have selfish goals, not for everybody, but for myself as well. Uh, Stephen, funny. I want to say one more thing. We're just now going to put the link to the handouts in the chat box. Oh, good. So then I can start my talk. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Let me uh, introduce the topic by telling you why it's so much fun talking about it. This is one of the areas that I talk about and give lectures, but I haven't done too much direct research in this area. I've done maybe one or two papers on writing, uh, little small things as usual. Um, this is stuff that I've learned about by reading the work of other people, and oh my, has it helped me. I owe these people a tremendous debt. It has made my life better, easier, more exciting, so I'm happy to share this with you. Great thrill was running into some of these people and meeting them. Uh, at a reading conference, I met Peter Elbow, I'm going to quote incessantly, and I was able to thank him for all the good he had done to my thought process, publications, etc. Here's the main point. Writing is really two things when we evaluate writing. It's writing style, whether you have complex sentences and good transitions and all that. And that comes from reading, period, from nowhere else. It can't be taught because it's too complicated. No one's even described it, or at least adequately. But writing does something else. When we write something down, we put our thoughts on the page 
And as we write and rewrite, we come up with better ideas. This is the whole point of the composing process research. Writing makes you smarter. That's what it does. And if you follow certain strategies called the composing process, you can do it too. They're easy to understand. We always, Alfie Cohnwood says, we, we give in to the undertow of traditional instruction. It's hard to keep ourselves disciplined to do it, but when we do it, the results are spectacular. Writing makes us smarter, and in doing this, we avoid writer's block. This is the way out of writer's block. Uh, here's Peter Elbow, great quote on the handout. Meaning is not what you, come, not what you end up with. Uh, I'm sorry, let me start all over again. Meaning is not what you start out with, it's what you end up with. You come up with ideas as you write. I'm gonna give you the four key elements of the traditional composing process as developed by Janet Eming, uh, Peter Elbow, all these people in the 1970s and 80s. And then of course, I'm gonna add two more, I can't help it. The core of everything, revision. Revision, revision, revision. The best quote, and I'm quoting someone else, these are not my words, Ernest Hemingway, the first draft of everything is shit. Revision is always the answer. Neil Simon, great playwright. Mediocre writers write, good writers rewrite. Neil Simon, Barefoot in the Park, all those great plays. He says, 95% of my work is revision. Learn to love revision. After reading all this research and insight on revision, when I have to revise, I'm happy because it means I'm learning something new. Kurt Vonnegut, great source of insight on this stuff. Uh, writing allows even a stupid person to seem halfway intelligent. If only that person will write the same thought over and over again, improving it just a little bit each time. A lot like inflating a blimp with a bicycle pump. Anybody can do it. All it takes is time. Uh, Vonnegut for a while lived in, was from Indiana, lived in the Midwest, and he was regularly invited to, to be on talk shows in Chicago, Irv Cups in a show, which I used to watch when I was younger. He said he was invited all the time, but he never said anything. He wondered why they invited him back. He never had anything to say. When someone asked him a question, if he hadn't tried to write about it, he had nothing to say. The same thing is true of me, let me tell you. Someone asked me a question like after these talks, if I haven't really thought about it, struggled over it, tried to write about it, I rarely have anything intelligent to say. So revision is the way. Don't feel bad when you revise. It's good, it's how you get smarter. Ah, uh, I keep, these things I'm telling you have helped me so much. This is the answer to writer's block right here. Good writers plan. Uh, you learned about planning when you were in high school. You had to make an outline, right? Uh, Roman numerals and all that. I use that too, I think it's a good method. Some people use circles and lines. I like the traditional way. And you've got a plan, but the key to planning, realize that your plan is not written in stone. You're gonna change it because as you write, you're gonna come up with new ideas. The plan is important. Be willing to change it. The problem with writing and planning is that once we get the plan down, we just wanna fill in the plan because we're in a hurry to get it done. I remember when I was in high school, which was 1906, uh, we had to do the, like in history class, we had to do examinations in class, 40 minutes. What are the three causes of World War I? So you have 40 minutes to do it. So you start writing, start writing. Writing makes you smarter. In the middle of writing, you realize those aren't the three reasons. I can think of three better reasons but you look at the clock and you only have five minutes left. You've got to sit on it, swallow it, turn in the wrong answer, or you don't have a paper. So timed examinations give us the wrong message about writing. They say that revision is an annoyance, it's an enemy. No, I have, again, from Vonnegut, from Hemingway and all these people, I have learned that when you think you have to revise, welcome it, it means you're about to learn something new. Uh, Peter Elbow recommends when you're about one third do through, 
just stop and re-outline the entire paper. I'll give you my anecdotes and stories uh, because I think, I hope they're the same as yours, what you've gradually discovered. I am so happy to present this to this audience because one of the reasons I decided to come back to the School of Education and met with Rob and he took me to lunch, it was very cool, uh, was to tell you this stuff, was to open the doors for more productivity and make life a lot easier. So this feels very good. Anyway, I'll tell you about a flight to Hong Kong. I was on my way to Hong Kong. In those days, we went on things called airplanes, right? It took forever. And I was going to a conference, and I had already written my paper. I was supposed to hand it in at the conference, and I did it, which is very rare for me. I usually give it in the talk. I get new ideas, et cetera. And I was just going to watch movies, which I hardly ever do on flights, just on meals. And there were three really good violent movies of so no interest and no would not make you a better person. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. And passengers came on. I got in my seat. Guy came on, sat next to me. I was in the aisle seat. He was in the middle seat. Big, ugly guy who looked like he has just escaped from prison and killed the guards on the way out. Big, you know, T-shirt showing his tattoos and everything. I put on my best macho personality. How are you doing there, buddy? He got in, sat down, immediately fell asleep on my shoulder. No, that's not, no. I didn't agree. And he started talking in his sleep. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. The son of a guy. So I got up. As soon as we got to 10,000 feet, I got up. And on international flights, some of you know, there's an area that are, you have snacks, you Coca-Cola and pretzels, you can have a balanced diet. And there's always an area where there's nothing. So I went over there and I stood for three hours, which was a relief because they didn't want to be next to this guy. And I took out my computer, pulled up my paper, and I re-outlined the entire paper. I found so many things that I didn't notice before. That's when I realized how wise Peter Elbow said to make the outline again. And again, my paper wasn't done. I had to rewrite it. And believe me, I've come along so much and so far in this way. I was very, very happy. So rewriting, re-outlining, rewriting, outlining again, um, et cetera. Okay, so that's flexible planning. Don't let new ideas be an annoyance. Rereading. Here's some great quotes. What good writers do? The minute they sit down to write in their session, they read what they wrote the day before. I know you don't want to do that. You got deadlines. I've got to get done. You plunge in. Sit back and reread. Hemingway says the same thing. I rise at first light, start by rereading and editing everything I've written to the point I left off. Uh, Maya Angelou did that. She, in fact, uh, rented a hotel room near where she lived and wrote every morning from nine o'clock, started in revising, seeing what she did the day before. While you were asleep, you were incubating, you were coming up with new ideas. So that's another universal, and it's a wonderful way of avoiding writer's block. One of the main causes of writer's block is not knowing where you are, losing your place. Elbow says you've got this big ball of string and you can't find the end. Reread what you did the last session, and you'll be right back in it with fresh new ideas. The fourth one is universal. Everyone says it, and it's great advice, and it's self-discipline to do it. Delay editing. The draft you're working on now won't be the last one. So there's no reason to edit every draft. Don't put on your makeup before you take your shower. It's the same idea. Wait till you're sure you're on the final draft and then do your revision. Also, if you revise all the way through, it's gonna interfere with the creative process. You're thinking about spelling, apostrophes, um, et cetera, and you lose your ideas. Wait till the end. Elbow, as usual, has a very nice way of saying it. He says, pretend you've hired an editor, and the editor is going to go over your final draft and take care of the spelling, punctuation, uh, all the things you're supposed to look at, then hire yourself, and then you're fine. 
Well, these are wonderful things. They've helped me. Uh, these are the basic four. I have added two more, of course. I wrote a paper on incubation. It's there on my website somewhere. SD, sdcrashen.com. Operators are standing by. They're all free. Uh, incubation. I got this from the work of Graham Wallace. I discovered his book in the University of Texas El Paso Library. I was giving a couple of talks there. I was fascinated by it. In those days, you did something called Xerox, okay? A Xerox, the entire 150 page manuscript at a nickel a page, that's what it cost in those days. Wow. Graham Wallace had it all down in those days. He said problem solving, he, he posited four steps of problem solving. First, you find the problem. Number two, you state the problem clearly. This is called wrestling, and then you wrestle with it, and you take time out, take a break, and incubate it. Then the solutions will come. There is a stage called incubation. Once you get the idea clearly in your mind, take a break, then come back, and the solutions will start to come. It allows the free working of the subconscious mind. As you'll see, this is nearly a universal. Uh, people who thought about creativity told a wonderful book, The Power of Now. All true artists, whether they know it or not, create from a place of no mind, from inner stillness. Breakthroughs come at a time of mental quietude. My favorite paper on all this, Poincaré. Mathematicians and physics students, you know, all about Poincaré. People think Poincaré should have gotten the Nobel Prize for relativity. His work was so important for Einstein. Einstein recognizes that. By the way, Einstein did not get the Nobel Prize for relativity. He got it for the photoelectric effect. Uh, there was this jealousy and rivalry, and they didn't want to give it to him. But Poincaré was wonderful. He wrote a paper on creativity, which is in every single collection I've ever seen on creativity. Here's what he talked about. When I get into a problem, he says in mathematics, this is 100 years ago or more, I stop. I get up from, and it happens all the time, I get up from the desk and I do something mindless. He doesn't go to work on another problem. It's something mindless. His example, I put some more wood on the fire. Then I go back. So it's a short break, but he's not worried about the work. And the log jam has broken up a little bit. Next time there's a problem, he takes another break, puts something away, etc. I would like to explain to you, describe to you, this is something I know you've wondered about, the secret life of Steve Krashen in hotel rooms. I'm gonna tell you what I do in hotel rooms, every gruesome detail. Here's what I do. When I get into a hotel room, gosh, I think those days might be over, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? The first thing I do, I put the suitcase on the bed. Then I sit down and I open the computer. I have a list of things I have to do. I have to write a letter of recommendation. I wanna write a letter to the editor, which is my hobby. And I have a manuscript I'm working on, some uh, very stubborn footnotes, et cetera, or manuscript I really have to read carefully. I start my writing. Within two minutes, I have a writer's block. I hope that makes you feel better. I, my life is one writer's block every few minutes, all day long. That's all it is. I then get up from the bed, uh, from the desk, go to the bed and open up my suitcase. I put away one shirt and hang it up. Then I go back to the manuscript. By the time the evening is over, say an hour, an hour and a half, I get in late, my suitcase is unpacked and things are hung up, which is really strange behavior for me, okay? I put things away and I've done my work. The inauthentic labor that we have to put, go through in life is made for us for incubation. That's what it's for. I don't think about cleaning my suitcase. I'm thinking about my work. Um, here's how I do the dishes. At my house, I do the dishes. I love doing the dishes. 
So when I do the dishes, you ever invite me over, I'll do the dishes. I'll be antisocial, so maybe not. I close the door and no one else comes in the kitchen, which they find very nice. I take out my computer and start to work. Writer's block. I wash three dishes, put them on the rack. Then another writer's block within moments. Dry two dishes, wash another three, whatever. I'm not trying to finish the dishes. I'm trying to finish the manuscript. I hardly notice the dishes. It's a good time to do this mindless work. So that's the time for incubation. Mindless work is our friend. It's the only time I can, because the mindless work is so excruciatingly dull. This is the best time for it. It's like painless. So that's number one, incubation. Uh, another source or another related to this is daily regular writing. I have looked at the literature on it, and I'll show you who's been responsible for cluing me in. Um, Irving Wallace, novelist, okay? Wrote biographies of people like Michelangelo. He also wrote an article on the writing composing process and was published in an academic journal. It's very good. His conclusion, here it is. The vast majority of authors keep some semblance of regular daily hours. This has been wonderful. Some of them keep certain times. Michael Chabon, my kind of guy, 10 p.m. till 4 a.m. Okay, I love it. Oh, night is so great. It's when the phone doesn't ring, which is the writer's worst enemy. Uh, Maya Angelou in her hotel room, uh, 6.30 in the morning till around noon. So some people do it according to the clock. Other people do it according to pages or words. They count the number of pages. The world champion of writing quantity, Stephen King, absolutely amazing. Turns out such good stuff, 10 pages a day. Uh, some people are word counters. I'm a word counter. I have a certain quota of words when I'm working on a manuscript, which is all the time. Uh, I'll tell you what my quota is, but I really shouldn't because don't use my quota. You'll find your own. Everyone has their own. I'll tell you mine anyway. When I'm working on a long manuscript, which is rare, more rare these days, 600 words. If I do less than that, I feel unfulfilled. Something's wrong. The minute I go over 600, I go stale. So you find it yourself, and it absolutely works. All these great writers had a way of becoming regimented, okay? So it's a good idea. You're going to work when you're writing. Writers have said that you punch in the time clock, um, et cetera. We're going to put things together, some glorious conclusions coming up, things I've learned from these wonderful people. Stephen King says, it all happens while you're writing. Don't wait for the muse. Don't wait for inspiration. Your job is to make sure the muse knows where you're going to be every day from nine till noon or seven to three, whenever you're going to be there. That's when the creative uh, spirit comes. Susan Sontag says something very similar. You can't wait for inspiration. Go for a walk. I'll think of some idea. No, you won't. You just go for a walk. Madeline Langle really nailed it, okay? Inspiration usually comes during work rather than before it. This is the single most important sentence I have read about writing. This has saved me enormously. Um, you know, since I live in Southern California, some of you do, you know that there's a law in Southern California. You must be involved in show business. Did you know that? It's, they can pull you over and say, let me see your script. What are you doing? And if you get stopped by the police for speeding, you can say, I'm late for a rehearsal. They'll let you go. They might even give you a police escort. So like everyone else in California, as I'm sure all of you know, because of my great fame in show business, I am involved in showbiz. I started 10, 11 years ago when I was 66, I think. And it's been great. I have written 10 musicals. Um, and sometimes I've been in them too. The, la the last, up, every single time, there have been more people in the audience than on the stage, which is really an accomplishment. I do them for the synagogue. I'm a member of a very interesting synagogue. It's called Reconstructionist. Oh my, they're so interesting, good people. 
And every year we put on a play. And the play is based on the book of Esther, the only play in the Bible where God does not appear. And it uh, uh, takes place in the Persian Empire. It's the same plot all the time uh, where uh, the king of Persia, Ashaverus, um, wants his wife to dance naked for his friends. We don't use that in the play because kids are there. Friends wants her to dance for her friends just to show her off. She refuses, the first feminist hero, I think. And uh, he gets really angry. And, uh, ban and well, the Jewish commentary, she's executed. The Christian commentary, she's banished. <clears throat> With the permission of my rabbis, I use the Christian commentary. I think it's better. The last version, we, we take liberties. I have her move to Malibu and open up a deli. Okay, you can do that. So we base it loosely on the book of Esther. And we use songs from movies like uh, uh, Frozen a couple of years ago, West Side Story, when you're a Jew, you're a Jew all the way, stuff like that. And we change it just like Weird Al Yankovic. Uh, anyway, here's what happens. The cast of the choir are the people in the choir. I'm sorry, the cast of the play are the people in the choir. The people I have been singing with for the last 15 years. The choir is a great experience. How you, it's how you prepare for the big holidays. Uh, the cantor is very sensitive to the spiritual aspects and really gets you in the mood for it. And every year, the, the choir says, so what are we going to do this year? What are we going to do this year? Because, you know, the same people are going to have the same parts. And I never know. And I keep procrastinating. The play is generally in March, which is when Passover the Purim is. And um, finally, I remember what Hemingway said. I remember what Madeline Lengel said. I remember what Stephen King and Susan Zontag said. The the muse is not going to visit me unless I sit down and write. And I remember regimentation. I remember people like Michael Chaban and Maya Angelou who have a certain amount of time or a certain amount of words. So I decided what I'm going to do, I'm going to do 10 minutes a day. That's it. And then I'm going to stop. And I start the day, the first day, with a blank sheet. I know what the plot is going to be. I just have to change it and make it fit into a movie. And maybe the first day I get nothing, I quit after five, 10 minutes. Then it incubates. The next day I have a few ideas. It starts coming. I may reject them, it doesn't matter. The first draft is done in two weeks. More in the composing process. I meet with the cantor, who is the spiritual director of the synagogue. And we do it, uh, some of you know the geography here, we do it at Denny's on Lincoln on Santa Monica, and uh, Santa Monica and Lincoln. And we sit in a booth and we have this, my script, and he goes over and tears it apart. He has a background in show business, I don't. He's been a professional choreographer, so he has a very clear visual sense, which I don't. So he always has revisions, which I take very seriously. And mostly when he says, this is no good, change it, I can see that he's right. And we sing the songs sitting in the booth. The last time we did this, at the end, we got up to leave. The people in the next booth applauded. They said, that was very nice. Come back soon sometime. Thanks for entertaining us. Anyway, so I get feedback from the cantor. I get feedback from the choir. They have gone through over and over again. They know the plot. They are acting in it. They know the story. So they always have original and interesting things to say. My estimate in my case, this is kind of an aberration in writers in general, but I managed to, I use nearly every revision because of the unique and talented and experienced group that gives it to me. My academic work, no. I trust myself and I'd say about, I only accept like 10, 15% of what other people say and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Well, so regular writing is the answer. And the guy I really got a lot of this from another scholar that has done me a lot of good. His name is uh, Robert Boyce, B-O-I-C-E. Robert Boyce was a professor at New York State University, uh, SUNY, uh, one of the campuses, and he was in the counseling department. Never met this guy, but I'd love to. It's such good ideas um, and has helped me a lot. His job was to counsel junior professors who are my target audience to some extent tonight significant percentage of the audiences are 10, 15 of you who are in that position. 
And in a few years, you're in a very precarious position. You're writing papers and you're going to be judged on your portfolio. And if you pass, you get tenure. If you don't pass, you get fired. So this is very, very scary. So you got to produce. So what I'm going to say now is directed at you. That's the people Boyce worked with. He worked with junior professors who were worried about getting tenure and he gave them great advice. He, he found with his first study, which was exploratory, that the professors kind of naturally divided into two groups. Half of them were daily, regular writers. They put aside some time, like 40 minutes a day, didn't matter how much time, two hours a day, 20 minutes a day, didn't matter. All of those who did that, they all got tenure, no problem. They had their publications done, the publications were good, the committees liked them. Not only that, when he interviewed them, he found their committee work was done without a problem. They never seemed to be in a hurry. They got everything done on time. The other group he called the binge writers, B-I-N-G-E. This is a term that comes from dieting. You know, you go on this, you know, uh, keto diet or whatever, and you're doing a fine job, and then you binge. You go into Baskin Robbins and you have three scoops of chocolate ice cream and you get all this sugar and the whole thing's blown. Uh, so that's what they do. They wait, they don't do anything for a few days and then they wait till the conditions are right and they binge write. And they say, I can't write until the conditions are perfect. I need five hours of absolute quiet. So quiet, traffic has to be diverted. Airplanes cannot fly overhead. The phones have to be disconnected, and I have to have a comfortable chair. Everything is right. These people never got tenure. None of them. That's the interesting thing in this study. No statistics. It was all or nothing. The daily regular writers all got tenure. The binge writers, none of them did. The reasons? Well, first of all, the ideal moment of several hours free with all conditions perfect never comes. It may come once a semester. Then you sit down to work, you've forgotten what you're working on. As I mentioned before, one of the problems that writers have when they take a break, they forget where they are. So you've got to do this all the time or you lose the flow, etc. So the regular writers did it. Charles Dickens, one of the great quotes of all times, if he missed a day of writing, he needed a week of hard slog to get back into the flow. That's me. That's you, unless you're built very, very differently. Even if it's five minutes, you've got to have that time to see where you are. Because once you do that, the incubation process comes. You're going to find, and most of some of you have seen this already, you're working on a project and you go somewhere, you go for a walk. We used to be able to do that, you go to the supermarket. And the world seems to be conspiring to help you with your work. You overhear a conversation and you get an idea about what you're writing. You read something for pleasure. Oh, that's the idea I was looking for. Someone makes an offhand comment, etc. So you've got to do it all the time. So that is the final point. I'm going to come to some conclusions now by asking a pedagogical, practical question. Should we test writing? I'm gonna argue no. Let me first, one of the real good reasons why is that it's the hardest thing to test. It's the absolutely the most anxiety provoking aspect of testing is testing writing. Uh, you don't know what the top is gonna to be. You worry about the topic, it's hard to prepare. And kids get very upset, nervous about it. I know I did when I was a student. Unless you, you know, what am I going to write about? What is the, do, am I going to get lucky? Is it the, just the question that I'm ready to write about or something else? And then you got to get it graded. Testing and grading writing is extremely difficult to get into rater reliability. If raters don't agree on what good writing is, those of us who've had our research judged by uh, referees and journals, you know, one referee will love it, one thinks it's okay, the other thinks it's the worst writing that's ever been done and there's rarely a high agreement. Don't test writing and you eliminate all that anxiety, all that pain.
Not only that, statistically, it's not necessary. If you test reading and writing, the reading and writing exams will correlate nearly perfectly because reading is where we get writing style. And that's really important when we test writing. So I have just saved, I hope, the human race an incredible amount of time, an incredible amount of money, pain. Don't test writing. If you've heard me speak about uh, oral language in the past, you know that I have the same view on testing speaking. It doesn't make sense. It's hard to do. And it's the most anxiety provoking and expensive thing to do because it's very hard to get into rate of reliability on speaking. I want to call a break here. The last the second section is going to be a lot longer. And we'll take a good pause. We'll take uh, two minutes to stand up or I don't know, at my age, it usually takes a little longer to do what some of you are going to do. Uh, but go do that, come back, and then we'll talk about the secrets of academic composing process and all the things I hope will make your professional life easier. And I think this applies to other writing as well. So let's pause for a little break and then come right back. Wonderful. Thanks, Dr. Kreshen. So a uh, two minute break, and then we'll be back together here. And uh, there's already, already some good questions coming in the chat. Um, and then at the end of the next portion, we will open up the Q&A pod um, for questions as well. And then we'll moderate some of those and get some more responses from, from Stephen. So thank you. OK. I hope there's not a long line in the bathroom. I'll be back. Terminator 23, I'll be back. Great. Um, while we're waiting here in the break, I am seeing a couple of comments. One, uh, Kave having problems downloading the handout. So we'll be sure to get that link to the handouts back in the uh, chat again. Um, and then I'm noting other questions that are coming in as well. So we'll get started here in a moment. Well, I hope I have the right hand out here. I got it confused with the other talk I gave this week, how to get rich in real estate, which I think is going to be very helpful. I can tell you how to get rich in real estate, though. You want to know in your spare time? Sure. Yeah, tell us. I, I figured this out. I used to watch these infomercials on how to make money late at night, and a lot of them about real estate. And the part I like best is when the guy looks in the camera and he says, I have these ideas, and I want to share them with you. My first thought was, why? Why aren't you out there making money through real estate? And then I realized how to make money through real estate. The way you do it is give seminars on getting rich through real estate. Of That's course. The secret, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the academic composing process. Am I ready to rock and roll? Uh, wonderful, yeah. Let's, okay. let's take it away. Okay, these are conjectures based a little bit on research and my experience and talking to my colleagues. There is a little bit of evidence for everything I'm going to say. Largely, they're pretty much uninvestigated, which is too bad. This is the academic composing process. How to write for publication. The most important one, don't be in a hurry. Deadlines are your worst enemy. The way to deal with deadlines is pretend they don't exist. Here's the irony. If you pretend you have all the time in the world, you'll get done faster. If you worry about the deadline, you will be immobilized and you'll be worried about the deadline. So work hard, don't be in a hurry, allow for information. This takes a lot of self-control, and I go through this every day. I've got stuff I've got to get done. I still have deadlines. We've got to have this article, or we can't publish it. I have to pretend that's not there. I went through this today, okay? Um, one researcher, Argonist, you see in the handout, there is no relationship 
between having deadlines and how famous you get. Scholars who report they've had lots of deadlines, scholars who don't have deadlines, no difference in their productivity, no difference in their success as academics. The problem is when you have deadlines, you start avoiding. You get all freaked out and you don't want to work. Here's a great uh, paper. Erickson has really done good work on uh, productivity eminence. Successful professionals, and he's, they've done this, this team has done this in all forms. They've done this in uh, ice skating, publication, scientific research. The really good ones put in more time, they do. And that article, that study has been kind of misinterpreted, I think, saying that you've got to put in lots of time. You've got to put in lots of time. No, you've got to put in a little more time, but do it steadily over the years. They have these wonderful charts where average scholars or average ice skaters, average wrestlers, whatever, and successful ones, the good ones, put in slightly more time. Then over 10 years, you see the difference is huge. So it isn't just simply sitting down, putting in time and all that, not worrying about it. Don't be in a hurry. Don't try to finish by tomorrow. Relax, then the incubation works, then the ideas come. So that's number one, take it easy. You'll get done faster. The ideas will come. Don't be intimidated by the deadline. Okay, this will be a, um, could be interpreted as a contradiction, it isn't. Because I've talked so much about how writing makes you smarter. But Peter Elbow, the hero of this whole composing process, says this, write before you do the reading. Don't start in by reading everything. Don't go through the complete literature. If you're gonna do a paper on, let's say, the silent period and language acquisition, don't read every single paper on the silent period. Don't even read mine, don't read any. Write down your ideas first. Then, once you've got your ideas, it's only a draft, then you could start reading to see if you agree with what these experts say, or whether they give you new ideas. Elbow says, it's easier to write now when you know less. This is absolutely brilliant. Uh, Elbow says, and here this repeats what I said before, if you read first, start to gather data first, chaos, it's easy to get lost. You have so much, it's like, Gra trying to grab hold of the beginning of a ball of string. Getting your first thoughts down when you don't know anything, you just have your ideas, keeps you from falling into paralysis. Again, this seems nonsensical. It means first you should get your ideas and then start writing. Wait till you have a pretty clear idea of your own ideas, which will change as you understand more. Believe me, this has worked for me. You got a paper to write on a given topic or a topic that interests you. First, write down what you think it's all about. Don't read anything. Then, once you've got it down, start to read. Everything will make more sense. You start to make repairs. Similar, read after you have a plan. Read narrowly. Oh gosh, we feel guilty unless we've read the whole literature. No. It's all wrong. Successful ap academics, it says here, read after they have a plan, only reading what they need to read for the paper they're working on now. They make no attempt to keep up with the literature. Again, I feel the undertow. Again, Alfie Cohn's a wonderful way of saying it. When a new journal comes in through the computer or the mail or whatever, I feel I have to read every article. I have to make notes in the margin. It might be on the test. Someone might ask me about it. When you do it, it's a complete and total waste of time. I've had this experience. You've had this experience. I still have a lot of papers, just paper journals with my marks on them as in the old fashioned days. And I'll pick up a journal that came in three weeks ago that I read and that I underlined, made notes in the margin. I look at it again, three weeks later, I have no idea of what the article was about. 
I can't understand what I said about it in the margin. It's gone because I wasn't working on that idea at the time. It wasn't a test of some hypothesis I had. If you read what you need to read to solve a problem, you remember it forever. This is the secret of memory. You remember things when they solve a problem for you. If it doesn't solve a problem, you'll forget it immediately. Bazerman's great paper. He looked at physicists, their behavior. In those days, you went to something called the library and you looked at the new journals and he found they didn't pay attention to all the articles. They put some aside. They only noted or made copies of articles they needed right then and now. That's all. Once you do that, you remember it forever. Mem problem solving is the secret to memory. There's a great poem, I think, that makes the point. You don't mind if I recite some romantic poetry? Do you love me or do you not? You told me once, but I forgot. The reason that's nonsense is you don't forget things like that, okay? You remember it forever. Uh, behavior in department stores and at shopping malls has fascinated me. I used to live near in Culver City, near the Fox Hills Mall. And that was my, my favorite mall to go through. I took my kids there all the time. And I developed an absolute encyclopedic knowledge of the Fox Hills Mall. Here's how it happened. I didn't go there and try to learn anything. They don't give you a map when you come in, then test you on the stores. You get 80% right, they let you shop. No, I, I got encyclopedic knowledge the same way you did by shopping and trying to find things. And I remembered. I remember, of course, where the bathrooms are. I remember where the drinking fountains are. I remember where the telephones are. In those days, we were very dependent on telephones. Stores I shopped in, I knew everything. Stores I never shopped in, I knew nothing. I like to think about what happens at pizza parlors, where my kids and I used to go to all the time, the Fox Hills Mall. There were two of them, and they had fundamentally different procedures. One place, when you ordered your pizza, you also ordered your drink at the same place, and you got it there. If you went to the other one, you said, I'd like to order my drink now, they'd look at you like you're crazy and totally incompetent. Say, no, no, you go over there to order your drink. What's wrong with you, stupid? Yeah, there was that tone of voice. Customers pick it up very quickly. The procedures are subtly different, but we master them very easily. We, we learn by solving problems. It's as simple as that. Well, so keeping up with the literature doesn't work. Keeping up with the literature means you're going to forget 90% of what you read. I only read when it's something I'm working on now. Okay, so get that. Um, in fact, when I do um, happen to read something where it isn't relevant to something now, but it might be later, I mark it. And then I make sure I know where to find it again. Okay, where do we get our ideas? Do we get our ideas from the research literature? No. This is a wonderful paper, Glukenjauk's paper. Good creative thinkers get most of their ideas from themselves, from their own work. Their work itself produces what they're going to work on next. When they read, they read to confirm their ideas or to see if they're wrong. They get their ideas from themselves. So the, the sequence is, Make sure your ideas are clear. Then read to see if there's support for your ideas. Oh, so-and-so said this in 1926, et cetera. Then you go back to your writing and see if it all fits in. That is the efficient way. Let's talk about writing up research. I think I can really save you some time and trouble. Uh, those of you who've taken classes in experimental design and research studies, you know that there's three different kinds of research. We are taught that there's only one, but that's not true. The one we are taught to believe is the way you do research is called primary research. In our field, you do a case study, you do an experiment, experimental things. You do pretest, uh, you do treatment, you do post-test, you do statistical tests, et cetera, then you write it up. That's only one way of doing research. 
most breakthroughs in science did not happen from one clearly done study. They came from secondary research and meta-analysis. Let me tell you what those are. Secondary research is going back to old data and reanalyzing it. Uh, one of the best times I had doing research, uh, Howard White, my student at the time, I think he now lives in Japan, uh, Howard and I looked at studies on spelling, one done in 1898, the other in 1902. Uh, one was called The Futility of the Spelling Grind, where uh, Professor Philback and I had lunch, it used to be the education library, and I spent lots of time just pleasure reading in old journals, and I came across these old articles, which are just gold. They looked at schools that had spelling instruction, compared them to classes that didn't have the instruction, and they did it in several different ways. Pages and pages of data. Now, they did this in 1902, 18, 1980, 1898, where they didn't have the statistical tests that we do now. All the ones that we have now, you know, the t test, the correlational analyses, uh, regression, et cetera, these came in the 1920s, years after. So, what Howard White and I did was we took this old data and we ran it through the mighty USC computers. We applied the ordinary statistical tests and we found people who did the studies were right. The studies absolutely came out. Uh, by the way, just a little bit of me uh, complaining, and this is called whining. I'll tell you what happened to the papers and I'll return to this point. We wrote them up and we submitted them to the Reading Research Quarterly, which is like the rolling stone of literacy research. They turned them down, all of our papers. Three reviewers, they all said the same thing. This is not a spelling journal. This is a reading journal. There are no spelling journals, by the way. And our conclusion, which we backed up, is that spelling comes from reading. But we managed to get it published. And I'll come back to that point. You'll always manage to get things published. Uh, don't lose heart. So what we did is we went back, used existing sets of data to see if our hypothesis was right. We go back to data that people hadn't looked at, way, sitting there waiting for us. All of Albert Einstein's work was secondary analysis. Taking another look at the Michelson-Morley studies, looking at the speed of light, and coming to somewhat different conclusions because Einstein had a better theoretical base to base it on, okay? When you do this, when you look at published data, and you use stuff that's already there, you're saving a lot of time. For, you're saving time for yourself, and you are honoring the sub these experimenters who put in all that time and work. So I think it's a good idea. So the first kind, primary uh, analysis, do a study, get the results, fresh data. Secondary analysis, which I do a lot of. When I see pages of data, I always see if I can reanalyze it. I can't help it. Sometimes you can, and it's interesting. The third kind, meta-analysis. And I learned about this when I was a beginning professor in the linguistics department at USC. I met a guy named Edward Purcell. Oh, Ed, where are you? He's the one that got me interested in all this research, taught me about regression, taught me about meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is taking a group of studies like let's say we have 25 studies of whether coffee drinking uh, makes you feel better. Of course it does. Um, you look at all the studies and you give, you look at the results of each one and you convert the results into one number. You treat it as one study and you can see whether you had an effect. Okay. This is the way to go. It's like doing a literature survey, but it's not a narrative survey. It's very quantitative. You can actually put a number in it. The big triumph here has been in the field of bilingual education, where we had a great deal of controversies. I think the meta-analyses that have been done uh, have really shown that when the research is set up properly, uh, bilingual education works quite well when you make the conditions correct. And the conclusion is not from one study, but researchers have looked at several, put them all together. When it's set up right and the conditions are right, it works, and this has been a great breakthrough. So my conclusions for this, First three, use existing sets of data. Avoid collecting fresh data whenever you can. If I'm on your committee, I will suggest to you, don't do a study. 
first look at other people's studies, see if you can learn things from there, reanalyze their data. Doing your own study is the last resort. Used published data and test scores. A good reason for doing this, especially in the field of education, we have to avoid testing school children, testing subjects, because it's not right. Kids are being over-tested anyway. Let's not add anything to their burden. We only test kids when we need to. If we have to, let's try to use the existing data. Let's use the published test scores. Try to use tools developed by other researchers. When you do that, not only do you save work and time and you honor the research, but it's easier to compare your work to their work. It's not cheating. It's very good science. The next breakthrough is the use of unobtrusive measures. By the book of the same name, I'll tell you about the most famous one. This book by Webb Campbell Schwartz and Secrets is absolutely marvelous. If you start reading it, it's like reading a good novel. I couldn't put it down when I started. For, here's a good example. I'll tell you some other ones too. Chicago, there's a famous Chevrolet dealer named Z Frank. Z Frank for your Chevrolet. They wanted to find out what radio stations the Chevrolet dealers should advertise on. They didn't do a survey, they didn't do a study. They went to the repair shops of Chevrolet dealers. They asked the repair serviceman, before you start working on the car, See where the radio dial is set. Those are the stations Chevrolet drivers are listening to. That's the ones they advertised on. That's called an unobtrusive method. Well, there's other good, con good contributions like that. Lots of other good examples. Uh, good study. <clears throat> they wanted to find out what stories made kids really excited which were the most scary, which were the most interesting. You could look at pupil dilation, that, that's kind of hard. They looked to see whether the children got closer to the teacher telling the story. That turned about to be a wonderful measure of scariness and in Krashen's terms, compellingness of the story. So do, do, uh, do this when you can. Uh, uh, Mishan Ashtari and I published a paper using this we uh, got the idea from Jeff McQuillan. This is an all USC starring uh, cast in the story. Jeff McQuillan is a graduate of, the, of our, uh, our department and uh, I was his dissertation chair in fact, and he developed the wear and tear study. If you wanna know whether students have read a book, go to the library where the book is popular, take it off the shelves and look for creasing. Look where the papers with their thumb smudges, the papers are a little bit worn, and you can tell what books, what pages were the most popular. Brilliant idea. Totally unobtrusive, didn't have to interfere with anyone. What uh, Nushan Ashtari was interested in was whether kids read books about Farsi, the language of, of uh, Iran. Uh, we're concerned about the future of Farsi in California, uh, basically in the valley where there are lots of Persian families. Do they read in Farsi? Do they want to find out more about Farsi? So Nishan went to these, Dr. Ashtari went to these libraries, took the books off the shelf that were about Farsi for people interested in learning Farsi. She applied McQuillan's wear and tear technique. Kids read maybe 5% of the books. They were a disaster. That shows no one's interested in grammar study and possibly also known as that my kids are not that much interested in Farsi, no matter what they say. They're not gonna put up with grammar. I think they are interested in Farsi, they're just not interested in grammar. Otherwise they wouldn't pick up the book. Remember the advice that you got in writing class, especially if it's academic writing, professional writing? Think in advance of where you want to publish your paper before you even begin and tailor your paper for a certain journal. I think that's a bad idea because you don't know. You don't know how the paper is going to turn out. Which journal? Forget it. Don't even look. Write the paper. If you're worried about making it fit the format of the journal of reading or whatever they call it these days, it's going to cramp your writing style. First, write your paper 
as you feel it should be ready, should be written, the paper will tell you how it should be written. You'll have a pretty good idea. If you're well read, it's gonna fall into one of the acceptable, the acceptable forms anyway. So forget it, wait, wait until you're done. If you're worried about fitting it into a narrow style for a journal, you'll be thinking about that and your creative juices will not emerge. Over consideration of audience disturbs the creative process. Forget audience. This is Peter Elbow's idea. I'm just applying it to academic. Don't think about your audience. Think about what you're gonna say, your writing, and it will come out okay. Now I have one of my original hypotheses here. I'm very hard to be very proud of this. When you quote it, uh, please, please cite me. The central table hypothesis. In my opinion, every empirical study has a central table. If you're in a hurry, the paper's too long, what you look for is the results. You don't start with the introduction and go through this and that in interminable pages where the writer has to show off that he's read everything and then the long section of the conclusion and the advice and, that you didn't ask for. You look for that one table where he's given, the author, he or she has given the results. That's the one you should write first. When you're writing up a study, write up the central table first. A very good idea is before you've done the study, once you know how you're gonna do it, do the table first, make up data, see if it works, see if it fits into this format. So if you're gonna study the effect of caffeine on academic performance, how are you gonna do it? You're gonna do a simple t-test with two groups? Well, set up the two by two table, see if that works for you. Is it gonna be a two by six analysis of variance or a regression study? Set that up you'll have a much clearer idea of how to set up the study. So the first step, do the table, a pretend table, then you run the study. So when you write the study, you first get the central table right. Then you're still in the results section, supporting tables. You're gonna have a few of them, a table that tells you where all the subjects are, you know, how old they were, where they lived, whatever, astrological sign, whichever, is you know interesting for your hypothesis. You find the, the, the data will tell you which are the ones you have to put in and only the ones you need. Then finish writing up the results section. Writing makes you smarter. You'll have better insight. Work on the results section first. Description of the subject, description of the test, the results, the central table. Then you can, took a, you can do the procedure. Who are the subjects? What time of day did we do this or why? Uh, you know about that, you've seen it. Only then, when you've written up the second and third portions, when you've written up the results and the procedure, then you can write the conclusion. I'll tell you how conclusions are done. You begin with a short summary of the results. And that's the first thing I look at. When I'm looking at the abstract, I never know what they're talking about. They never get to the point. I don't look at the introduction, I have no idea. I look at the conclusion, the first few lines tells you what the study was. Eventually I have to read the whole thing, but this helps make it comprehensible. After the summary of the conclusions, the next section I call the apologies, where the author apologizes for all the mistakes that were made and claims, and he'll never do that again, and I'm sorry, these are the flaws in the study. Okay, that you gotta do. Then the implications. And here is the part that drives me crazy and the future research. They go on and on and on. If you need a long discussion of the implications and what future research needs to be done, you have no business reading that paper. You should know the field already because that's how journal papers are written. You don't have to go through the whole thing. Here is the conclusion to Crick and Watson's prize-winning, Nobel Prize-winning paper. By the way, if you just put in Crick and Watson double helix into Google, their paper will pop up. It's right there. It's online. You can read it. This is the last part. This is the whole, the whole discussion. It has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we've postulated suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. We know, reader, that you're no dummy. You know the stuff. You see the implications. Go read about it. Here's, here's what you can do next. 
the hardest part for reading should be the easiest is the introduction. People write in our field, in education and in language studies, uh, they're inspired by dissertations. Unfortunately, they write the whole dissertation as the journal paper and it goes on and on and on. And you lose focus as to what's going on. All you want to do is assume the reader knows the field. This is not the reader's first experience reading about, you know, whatever it is, you know, what you learn from playing video games or whatever. Keep it focused. Only what the reader needs to know to frame the discussion. Just a reminder, this is what this is about. Do this last. When you're clear of what your article is about, then you'll know what to put in. Okay, the big question, what about rejection? I'd like to recommend a book called Rotten Reviews. You're gonna love it. Famous authors whose works were totally trashed by the critics and what they say about it and their comments at the end. Well, here's what you don't know that I know and the professors in the audience knows. Everybody gets rejected and they get rejected all the time. The, Psychology journals, 2013, 76% rejected. Our field has a higher rate of rejection. Nearly everything gets rejected in our field. In the literacy journals, it's like 90%. And I think I know why. Because the articles are too long and they try to do too much. When you have a long article and you try to do, call in German, a Gesamtkunstwerk, everything together, it can't be consistent. It can't be easy to read. You're trying to do too much. Keep it narrow and you have a better chance of getting something published and actually educating the readers. So everyone gets rejected. Everyone. Uh, I would say, I went through one stretch about 20 years ago. I counted them. I submitted 19 things for publication, journals, books, in one two-year stretch. 18 were rejected. And that's how I finally learned how to do it, how to make it better. It happens to everyone. Here's what you do. First of all, oh, let me first go to the big question, follow my outline, okay. Are they unfair? Are they arbitrary? Uh, yeah, you can argue that, great study. Peterson to see here now, 1982. Oh, this felt so good when I read it. And this paper that they wrote about was rejected, all right. They looked at 12 papers that had appeared in major journals in psychology that were accepted, they were published. They changed them, they put in phony names, they changed tiny details, resubmitted them to the same journals under different names. Eight of them were rejected, usually on methodological grounds, okay? So there is an amount of arbitrariness. Uh, reviewers don't agree all the time. And some really great papers have been rejected. It's obvious why if you get a, a journal that has a, a policy of each, our, each article is going to be reviewed by three referees, one negative review, the paper is going to be rejected. So what happens is it's a push toward mediocrity. You want a paper where no one's going to get, I just got rejected a few months ago. I'm still kind of angry. Okay, I'll get over it. I have to take my medication. Anyway, I got rejected. I don't want to mention any names, foreign language journals. One of the best papers I ever read, I ever, ever, ever wrote, I mean. And uh, it got rejected because one reviewer didn't like it. Four reviewers, three of them thought it was a great paper. I agreed with them, of course. And the guy had a nonsense review. He said, well, uh, Krashen is saying all this stuff, but what about all these other studies? How about these criticisms he hasn't responded to? Let's include those. And I wrote the reviewer back and I said, actually, I have responded to them, but I don't want to include them here or even mention them because that's not the point of my paper. My paper, oh no, we've got to include, paper was rejected. I got it published somewhere else, which is the moral of the story. You'll get it published somewhere else. Don't worry if it's rejected. When you get criticisms, and this has been shown, the ones that appeared in Rotten Reviews, great papers that were rejected, all of them got published eventually Oh my, if you read um, what has happened to authors, every famous author has over and over again, they tell stories of how many rejections they had and this great work came out. So keep on trucking. 
It's going to work out eventually. When you do get rejected, don't delay. Deal with it immediately. Don't let it sit on your desk, you know, poisoning your insides. Read the criticisms immediately. Right away, if some of the criticisms you think are right, accept them. Of course, I've had some very good reviews that I've really been educated by. They've been wonderful. This is the loyal opposition. People I knew disagreed with me. And they made some wonderful points which have guided my subsequent research, showing, you know, I can account for that. Reject the ones you think are wrong-headed, that are irrelevant and unprofessional. And if the journal won't accept it, don't change your paper. You are responsible for the content. Don't say, gee, I had to put that in or I couldn't get the paper published. Everyone will think you're a jerk if you do that. Accept the holiness of your paper. If you think the paper is right, get it published as you think it's right. Find another journal, resubmit it, it's worth it. Accept the ones you think are right, forget the ones you think are wrong. It's your paper. You are responsible for the content. You can't blame the reviewers who wouldn't let you publish it. I'm gonna summarize the whole thing now, what I said in both parts. Um, GW here means good writers. Good writers, and this is the main one, revision helps you come up with new ideas. Revision and editing are different. They have a plan, but you can change the plans. They reread what they've written, otherwise they lose their place. They delay editing, like Peter Elbo tells us, until they work out their ideas. They incubate regular periods of relaxation. Sometimes they build it into their workday. Uh, Einstein took time off went in his boat, um, et cetera. Um, treat writing as a job, keep regular hours, have set goals, and write regularly. Don't wait for that golden moment, because by the time it gets there, you'll have forgotten where you are. They don't worry about audience. Elbow's very big on this. Until That's why don't worry about what journal, until your ideas are worked out. Then look at your finished product, and the paper will tell you where you should submit it. Good academic writers ignore deadlines. They work in a relaxed but focused manner. If you have a tough spot and you've been in a writer's block, respect it, take your time, work on it, rushing through it, you'll have that block forever. Write out your ideas before you review the literature. Narrow reading, read only what you have to. Don't try to keep up with the literature that never works. No one can keep track of it. Return to your plan, your outline, when you're reading other people's research. Respect secondary and meta-analysis. Primary research is only one way of doing it, and it's not the best way. The ideas that have worked throughout time are when people have gone and looked at the research that's come before. I'll come back to that point because it's real important. Take advantage of existing sets of data. Try to do unobtrusive, I really recommend that book, Unobtrusive Studies, you can get used copies. Um, they, take, they use tools developed by other scholars and let people use your tools. They don't worry about where they're gonna publish it. Again, that's audience again. How to write it up, do the central table first. Then the peripheral tables in the procedure section, then the introduction, then the conclusion. The introduction is not a review of the literature. I had to write a review of the literature in graduate school. It was part of our qualifying examinations. That year was a total and complete waste. Uh, my area of specialization was psycholinguistics, and I read everything on psycholinguistics. Areas I had the slightest interest in because I was responsible for it. I hardly remember any of them. It was wasted time because it wasn't problems I was trying to solve. Deal with reviews and rejections without delay. Yeah, there's arbitrariness in journals. There's unfairness. But hang in there. You'll get it published where you need to. And now a very interesting section. A guy named Simonton, Dean Keith Simonton, writes wonderful books on creativity. I have all the books I could take of this guy. It's great. New one, I always get it and write his, his journal, journal papers. 
He's a philosopher of science and he does research, empirical research. The question he asked in this one article, are great thinkers ahead of the times or with the times? Well, the obvious answer is they're ahead of the times, obviously. The answer is none of the above. They're not ahead of the times. They're not with the times. In nearly every case, the ones who have made a name are behind the times. They are concerned with ideas that are no longer interesting to most people. They hang in there. Chomsky was like that. He went back and looked at Descartes, looked at philosophy of science. That was his major interest. People had not looked at it before, the innateness question that is no longer fashionable, and created the world of linguistics based on those issues. People who are eminent thinkers focus on questions and issues that they decide are important. The issues will leap out of the page and speak to you. They will tell you, you're reading this, you're the one I've been waiting for to pick up the ball. They are generally unrepresentative of their times. They're considered outliers during the time they, they're doing their work. Their less distinguished colleagues, the ones who are not the keynote speakers invited to give webinars at USC and all that, are generally not, they're generally more representative of their time, but they're not the ones who are known when time goes on. The impressive thinkers are ruggedly independent of the zeitgeist, of the spirit of the times. They go back, things that are gone, they pick it up because they find it interesting. Wonderful quote here by Simonton, eminent thinkers are oddly backward looking in their ideas. They struggle to consolidate the ideas of the past into an overarching synthesis. They'll look at something as we did published in you know, 1898 and see if it makes sense in terms of today. And one of the problems that everything being in computers now, you can't do what I used to do in the education library. I used to spend most of my time there where you just browse through the old articles and see people were writing in the 1920s. There's so much delicious stuffs there that will really speak to you. Most breakthroughs do not come from ex one experiment, but from people trying to make sense of everything. Of course, this doesn't, agree, this doesn't mean that just because you're ruggedly independent that you're a great thinker. There are a lot of ruggedly independent thinkers who research is a bunch of junk. Well, let me end here. And we're now turning to the question and answer part. How does this work, Rob? Do I ask questions or do they ask questions? You know, oh, we're going to, we're, okay. we're getting a lot of great questions already in the chat. And so uh, Katya and I will moderate and ping pong back and forth and send you some questions if that's okay. That's wonderful. Um, and we're getting a good number. So, you know, we'll have to, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you. Um, I, you know, I've, I've, I've watched many of your talks. I'm always thankful for not only your pithy points, but the fact that they're, wrapped in engaging and even entertaining um, talks. And that really makes us, you know, th that makes this enjoyable. I've always liked you, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I love the theme of, of working smarter, not harder. That makes us do better work, helps us avoid stress, which, you know, allows us to do better work. So thank you. So here are some questions. Uh, this one I think is from Diana. Um, I just came out of a great TESOL class learning about learning and acquisition. Can you provide a similar contrast in terms of learning how to write versus acquiring the facility to write? Well, in terms of style, absolutely. Writing style is far too complex to be consciously learned. In fact, if you look at the, the scholars on discourse analysis, I've read all their books and oh my gosh, I remember looking at Swale's big volume on academic writing. We were office mates one summer. And I read his article on how to write on abstracts. What is the style of abstracts? And he, write like, he wrote like four papers on it, and every one was different because he made new discoveries. He couldn't keep it straight. As I read it, I realized, yeah, a lot of what he's saying is right because I had acquired it. You'd have the same reaction because a lot of you have read like 200 articles where there's the abstract first. You can't teach from that stuff. What he's doing is demonstrating that acquisition of style is how it's done. 
It cannot be taught. It comes from massive amounts of engaged reading. In terms of, so that's in terms of writing style. In terms of where ideas come from, it's all acquisition, folks. It's all relaxing and letting it come from your subconscious. And here, the debate, I don't think we could easily settle it today, is whether the ideas come from your higher self or are they from the other side? Are they being channeled? Who knows? <laughs> but it's not from hard work. It's from stating the problem clearly and letting your higher self or your spirit guide who is ever working for you present parts of the solution to you. That makes life a lot easy, a lot easier. Great. Good question. Good questions are defined as, as I've mentioned, those I've written about, thought about. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I have no idea. Katya's got one. Yeah, thank you for that. So we have a question from Shuhan Yang, who is uh, saying the following. Uh, Dr. Kraushen mentioned earlier that writing should not be tested. So I was wondering, uh, Dr. Kraushen's perspective in students who use writing templates for English writing tests they are required to take. So for non-native uh, speakers of English, for example, uh, taking English writing exam uh, is often a must. Uh, TOEFL, for example, uh, or for applying to college or job applications. And so many times English writing becomes a difficult task. So students tend to imitate templates just to get the desirable results. Does this count as successful writing if students memorize and imitate the template? The easy solution, you know I'm gonna say this, dump writing tests. The problem disappears. That's the only way. Most of our problems in testing writing are unsolvable, can't be done. So dump the whole thing. If I were in that situation and it was life and death and I had to pass the test, I might find a template. If it was a second language especially, if I was writing say in French and you know I'm not quite sure this is exactly the way to do it, I might find some essay, someone else, copy their style, just to get through. But then I'd spend the rest of my life working to eliminate writing tests. Uh, Dr. Krashen, Sampson has a question about the idea of writing before you read and not binging. Um, how do these habits that you've talked about and these principles, um, how do they apply to the current school age children? Um, many in our audience may have cousins, children, brothers and sisters. Uh, how is this pandemic related to the ideas of writing that you talked about tonight? Well, that's two questions in one, or it's actually seven questions in one that I can count. One is how do we do all this in the current age of everything being distant education? Uh oh. We lost your audio, sorry. Okay, are we back? You're back. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna interpret the question that way. In today's modern age where we're home and we're doing the whole thing as we're doing it now on a TV screen, what happens then? Well, in some ways for language teaching, let me limit it to language teaching for the moment. And let me limit it to beginning language teaching. We're better off. I've made no secret of my huge admiration for my colleague, Beniko Mason of Japan. I was, she wasn't my student, okay? But I'll tell you the story anyway. Everybody likes to hear these stories of interactions of professors and students and what really goes on. Um, she was a colleague and living in Japan and she was getting her degree in an English speaking university, Temple University in, in, in Tokyo. And she got to be very good friends with me and another group of scholars, C and Lee and, and uh, Kyung Suk Cho and we all hung out. And whenever I came to Asia, we'd all meet and exchange our research, occasionally co-author. We still do that, it's still great. And Benico didn't have her doctorate and she decided to get it at this university. C and I decided to get on her committee. <laughs> we decided to stack the deck and I'm so glad we did. And if I'm gonna hurt feelings of members of the faculty, I'm glad, because I don't care. She had a brilliant dissertation topic, in my opinion. She had three groups. One group uh, just did reading for pleasure, 
This is English as a foreign language. The other group did English reading for pleasure and writing in English. Another group wrote descriptions of what they read in Japanese. And we compared their progress. When in terms of efficiency, time devoted, reading alone was much better. And in terms of attainment, they were all the same. I thought it was amazing breakthrough. I was convinced the committee had no idea what she was getting at. It's one of those things. The people in the room who understood what she was after was me, her husband, Steve, who came. He understood everything, of course, and he was going like this in the back. And a few of us were, you know, we were absolutely with it. I think if, if I wasn't there, she wouldn't have passed because we had to explain why this was an interesting thing. So that's the backdrop. The ideas that now seem so obvious to us, because Steve, her husband, and me, we'd been living with these ideas for years. So, But to even, I'd say, competent academics, this was so new and so different, they could not understand how it could work, and they lost track of what she was doing. So I'm not really criticizing them. I do understand. That shows how different these, uh, these ideas are. What was the question again? I'm sorry, I'm getting lost. Keep giving you stories. Oh yeah, uh, doing the thing on the computer. I would use Benico's methods. Uh, the beginning part of Benico's method in teaching foreign language is called story listening. Stories, tell stories to kids and make them comprehensible. She claims she got the idea from me. I didn't know that. My sample lesson that I give in German, some of you have heard, you know, das ist mein Kopf, hier sind meine Ohren. Wie viel Ohren? Eins, zwei, you know. And she said that was the idea. She tells a story of universal interest, usually from Grimm fairy tales, Grimm's fairy tales, and she makes it comprehensible by drawings. Drawing the, you know, there were two men. You draw a picture of a man. One, two. Uh, she will occasionally translate into Japanese a word here and there, and explain in other ways, in other descriptions. And she finds you better vocabulary development that way. There's no pressure to remember the vocabulary. And the time in doing exercises and vocabulary is wasted. I would use a method like that. When you use it for things that don't work, it doesn't work with the system. If you want to say, people complain and say, well, if you do it that way and you're just telling stories, kids can't talk. What if they want to talk? Well, talking doesn't really help you. You acquire language by input. What if they make mistakes? How can we correct their mistake? Air correction doesn't work. Look at the re research. It's very, very weak. Uh, what if they, you know, they won't have time to write? We don't learn to write by writing. We learn to write by reading. So um, how can we check and make sure they've understood? Benico and I wrote a paper on uh, comprehension checking. And the feeling then was you interrupt and you say, what does that word mean? Uh, please translate the sentence to make sure you understood. And we argued that just disrupts the story. If people want to get a repetition, they can raise their hand, say, do it again. And when it's on the screen and you have options, you can change the station. Isn't that wonderful? You can find an easier story. So in this way, I'm not claiming it's true of all distance education, but it works right in favor of the theory. It's the only way to make the theory happen, I think. I know that may not be true in other more sophisticated things other than beginning language teaching. But at least in our domain, it works very nicely. Algo mas. You got to unmute. There we go. Got unmute, yeah. uh, thank you so much. Uh, there is a question um, somewhat related to uh, using two languages. Uh, so what do you think about the switching of first and second language in academic writing? Do you recommend thinking in L1 and then translating it into L2 to finish a paper in L2? Uh, and then a separate question, can uh, translation software and grammar modification software help students in academic writing? Okay, one at a time, because I will probably have forgotten the second question, and I'm busy forgetting the first question while I'm thinking about the second question. So I'm just as dense with this stuff as anybody else. Okay, how about the use of the first language in ideas? Um, you look at what people say who are, let's say, dominant or they're better in their primary language than they are in English, and they'll tell you this happens all the time. Writing makes you smarter. Use the first language. The few times when I've written papers in other languages, 
I always write the version in English first. Always. Otherwise, I'm worried about subject verb agreement. I don't know the word for it. I get curious. The linguist, linguist in me crops up. Always do it in the prior. Other if people may be better in the other language than I am, don't have to do that when it can simply flow. There's nothing wrong. There's no reason not to. More writing will not make you a better writer anyway. You're not losing anything, but you'll get better ideas that way. And then you're the winner for it. I think writing in the first language is a wonderful idea. Nothing wrong. Now, in terms of bilingual education in general, which was the major part of my life in the 1980s, oh boy, very simple. When you learn things in your primary language, it can make the second language more comprehensible. Let's say you're going to take a class in another language and you're not really good at it. Read all the stuff in your own language, get the background, then the class is more comprehensible. Children who have, let's say, we're in Spanish English bilingual programs. If they get Spanish in the, in the home language, say they get it in Spanish, when they then get it in English or they continue on in English, it's much more comprehensible. They do much better. If it's in, for beginners, it's the best way to go. Child comes into first grade or kindergarten knowing no English, you're much better off giving them subject matter in the primary language and high quality ESL. It gets the, what the research studies say, the bilingual meta analyses, you now know what that is. When programs do that, when they give you background knowledge in the first language, subject matter teaching in the first language, and good comprehensible input in English, like good ESL, in the long run, you get better English development. It's win-win. And you continue to develop the primary language, and that is win-win. That's another lecture, though. Thank you, Dr. Krashen. Uh, there are a couple of questions here that sort of center around inspiration and confidence. Nadia says, you know, I might have some problems getting that first idea when I'm confronted with an assignment. Uh, Lucy talks about maybe not feeling very confident about her own opinion about an issue and hesitant to speak up or start with a piece of writing and suggests that it might have to do with self-confidence. Do you have any more suggestions or things you want to reiterate just about increasing uh, our attendees inspiration levels of confidence when they tackle well the, the easy part is to be writing about something that burns inside you that's a topic you really care about then what's going to happen is you'll have no problems with self-confidence you'll be too busy being interested in the com in the in the in the uh, content yeah. I, I actually wrote a paper in an area that I had no business writing in. I got interested in apricot pits. Are you aware of the controversy of apricot pits? It's called Laetrile. It's called a quack cure for cancer. I know nothing about this stuff, but I read this book, right-wing scholarship. The guy was completely off the wall where he said the whole thing was a fraud. The Mayo Clinic decided it was a fraud. Now, I know experimental design, so I read the studies. And I found that it's not necessarily wrong. I, my conclusion was the jury is out on Laetrile. Uh, there's, we really don't know. And it was prematurely excluded. And I got so excited with the debate that I learned an enormous amount of chemistry this way, simply reading the articles and trying to understand them. And when it was time to, am I gonna publish this? It wasn't, am I gonna be a fool? I have a responsibility. That's what I felt. I have a responsibility to get it published somewhere, which I did. I wrote three papers on it, published them in scientific journals. No one criticized my lack of science, okay? But I felt it was my responsibility. And that's what's gonna to happen to people with self-confident crises. Find a topic that burns inside, write about it. First, write down your opinion, then read about it. You'll find, because it burns inside you, you'll have something to say. You'll realize that you may have an insight that no one else has had, or you may be confirming what used to be a crackpot idea, and you will feel responsible to tell other people about it. Self-esteem disappears. It's what we say about comprehension of language. When the input is compelling, the affective filter disappears.
when you get so involved in what is being said. That's pretty good advice, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, this is really great. So we have uh, another interesting question from Ilana. Uh, Ilana is wondering about students who have learning disabilities. So her oh. question is, is it better or more effective to focus on having them learn English as opposed to teaching them content in their home language? Ah, uh, good one, good one. Well, my, I, I can make predictions. The research is not there, which is shocking and inexcusable, of course. My first impulse when we deal with learning problems is to understand that it basically only slows things down. It doesn't change anything. When you have, say, uh, this and that syndrome, it's not that the child can't learn, it's that they can't keep up with the arbitrary requirements, the arbitrary nature of school. We are doing a school under the Prussian system of standards, which came to the United States. Those of you who know history of education, the 1870s, 1880s, the Committee of Nine, the Committee of Twelve met, and they took the Prussian system. These are the things students need to know at this age. When you're five, you should know this. When you're eight, you should know that. And it was all made up. They didn't know. It wasn't based on anything. And if you fall behind to something seriously wrong, children are getting behind. Well, it's not what the child knows now, it's what the child is gonna know later on, not how fast they get there. So kids with learning problems generally are slower, that's all. Take your time, use the methods we know now, and they'll get there. And this is a hypothesis that needs to be tested. Not, don't take my word for it, I've, I think it's probably right, but let's see what happens when we use comprehensible input when we use the first language in a way that, say, Jim Cummins says to use it, and he's been right all along, use it, you know, the foundation in the first language, et cetera. If it works in so-called normal, so-called speed, sped up people, it might work for everybody. Uh, our problem is standards and the insistence on grade level. Did you guys know that half of the children in our country or below grade level, because grade level means the 50th percentile. And I hear people say, we're gonna get everyone up to grade level. And I say it's statistically impossible because it's the, it's in, it's the it's 50th percentile. You can't, have, you can't have everyone above average, okay? Like we'll be gone. They say, we're gonna work hard and we're gonna do it, okay? So the whole idea of standards, grade level, all that is based on nonsense mathematics, nonsense statistics. Uh, uh, being a slow learner, I'm very partial to this. I didn't reach puberty until I was 28, but that's another story. I made up for it. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares how long it takes you? Einstein's the great example of this. And kids are largely uh, behind, behind, because they don't care, because the stuff isn't compelling. It's not interesting. So we have to take another look at this. Great, thank you. Uh, Kave, Dr. Kreshen, has a question, sort of, I think, on behalf of the scholars or aspiring scholars out there. You've talked a lot about um, writing practices that we should be considering, but he's asking, are there any additional tips for writers who are trying to publish? And part of that might be having to do with the fact that uh, many of the journals that we aspire to get into are written in English, um, are there other strategies that you have in mind for those that want to publish? Well, that is, uh, we've looked at this, um, the research on a language that you're published in. Not only is it English, but it's getting worse. And it's a two-edged sword, as we all agree. English as the international language has been fabulous. We now see that, you know, Poland can talk to Lithuania, no problem. Airline safety has increased marvelously since English has become the international language of communication. The tragedy is what has happened to the native language, and it's not just in publishing in journals, it's everywhere. Uh, when we lose languages, we lose a whole literature. Uh, children lose the source of wisdom with their elders. Uh, so we really want both. It would be great if people could publish in both. I don't know if it's gonna happen in publication. I think English is gonna remain the language of publication. What's going to happen though, I hope, 
and I'm doing my best as a referee of articles, is that we're gonna relax the requirements. The people I know that I work with who are super advanced speakers and writers of English as a second language make mistakes. I know because I edit their papers for them sometimes. They all make mistakes. All my uh, former students from Asia make mistakes with the indefinite article, definite article. My feeling is that if Benico Mason or Kyung Suk Cho makes a mistake, it's not a mistake. The language is changing. It's their language too. Good example, so-called Indian English. If you submit a paper and you're a scholar from New Delhi, and you have a sentence like, the truth is obvious, isn't it? That's fine. But then you use isn't it everywhere. John is a boy, isn't it? That's grammatical in Indian language. From now on, if that's in an academic paper, it's not wrong. So respected prestige versions are fine. Gradually, we're going to loosen up on these things that never change meaning, that are completely incomprehensible. So we're going to make it somewhat easier for everyone to publish in English. And now I'm gonna get some of you in big trouble. This is the end of our friendship, I'm warning you. It is the responsibility of native speakers of English to help non-native speakers go over their final drafts and help them make the few cosmetic changes. Each one of us should be working with three or four non-native speakers and, and until it reaches the day when all varieties are accepted, it's up to us. We've had this easy road and we've got to help out our colleagues. So I, part of, a big part of my life is reading papers written by my colleagues in Korea, colleagues in Taiwan, colleagues in Japan, and I simply accept it as part of what we have to do to make up for the fact that we've had the easy road. So it's Great. going to be English. Thank you for that. Okay, so we have one more question. So um, you mentioned that uh, this is from an anonymous uh, attendee. Uh, you mentioned that grammar and vocabulary could be acquired by general pleasure reading. Uh, it is receptive language, right? Uh, how how do we how do we transfer the receptive language to the productive one in the writing and speaking? It's called language acquisition, and it happens all by itself. It's happened to you. It's happened to me. It's simply there. It, it's the only way. You rarely use these things in production anyway. Everyone in this room, and not only that, it's, it's, you can't forget it once you've got it. All of you, or two-thirds of you, have this problem. You don't use a language for ages. And I've gone like, my best second language is German. I've gone like three, four years without speaking a word of German to anyone. I live in Southern California. I don't speak a lot of German in Santa Monica and in downtown LA. It just doesn't happen. And I don't worry about it. I read a lot in German. Same things in French. I have one French author, science fiction author. Check out Bernard Weber. Oh my gosh, so good. I do pleasure reading in other languages all the time. And when it's time to use them, it's there. It's there, and some people say it's better than it was before because in the year I haven't been to Europe, I've read maybe 50 novels for pleasure because I like them, all my pleasure readings in other languages. I'm doing an experiment now on myself. You got to do this on yourself. You got to have doing this in, in language studies. Benico Mason has claimed, which she's doing with her students, she has a phase in between the story phase and the free reading phase. She calls guided self selected reading where her students find reading with her help, finding the right stuff, because it's hard to know which is gonna be right for you. What? And she says, like graded readers, you don't read five of them, 10 of them, you read 300 of them. Then you're ready to read the authentic stuff. And it takes a couple of years. We have underestimated how long it takes, how much pleasure reading, it's pleasure, so it's not suffering, is needed. Uh, I've been experimenting. My Spanish is okay. Um, I can read you know, authentic things. I can have a conversation. But I'm taking Benico at her word, and I'm collecting graded readers in Spanish for use in Spanish 2, Spanish 3, etc. 
and I'm reading them all the time. The problem is it costs money, it costs five bucks each. And then if I want to do a hundred of them, that's $500. That's a lot of money. So I'm waiting till people put them online. I'll be downloading them. Okay. And it works. The reason I know it works since I've been doing this, I have indication that my spoke, spoken Spanish is better. My grammar is better. Um, I wear a mask, but I go out at Ralph's once early Friday morning because from seven to eight, it's for old people only. And there's lots of room in the store and I can shop, pick up what I need. The guy in the counter, I see all the time. I speak Spanish to him all the time. And I say, I'm here to help you with your Spanish. I'll let you know if you make a mistake, okay? And he's now speaking faster and faster to me. I've noticed as the months go by, he's using more complicated vocabulary without realizing it. I'm getting better. And it's from reading these silly, silly little novels. I'm not practicing output. I'm getting more input. Um, Steve Kaufman has been a big help to me. Steve Kaufman is a, he's now a professional polyglot. That's what he does for a living. He speaks like 17 languages. He's really something. Ah, by the way, a little footnote here. 17 languages. He's done six of them since age 62. Is that good news or what? That's wonderful. And I've been with him speaking these languages. At ACFA one year, we went out to lunch with my, with my Chinese teacher, my Mandarin teacher and her friends. He was great. I watched a lecture on, on YouTube, my favorite topic. It was Krashen's theory of language acquisition, and it was in Canadian French. Steve was right there. His comments were bang on. His French was super. We've been together in Mexican restaurants. He's fluent. He's, he's the real thing. Uh, he says, here's the part that helped me. Have you ever been in a situation speaking another language where you think you know the word, you're really close, but you're not quite there and it's frustrating. What do you do about it? Well, our tendency is to look it up, write it out, do exercises. He says, forget it, keep reading, keep listening. It's gonna come up, it's gonna come back. Have faith that input contains I plus one. It will be there for you. You will acquire it, maybe not next week, but you're gonna get it. That has helped me enormously. My answer to the question on output, keep getting more input, get a lot of it, have faith in language acquisition, find more and more books that are easy and fabulously interesting, so interesting you forget that it's in a second language and that's the hardest task. All right, well, thank you so much. So um, we'll wrap up our discussion here. Um, and um, so today we, you talked about writing, uh, but of course the question of reading came up because those processes are not disconnected. We cannot think about writing without thinking about reading. Uh, we cannot, as people interested in TESOL and second language acquisition, of course we are interested in writing in first language, writing in a second language, and again, it's not disconnected. I think we're walking away with some very important lessons. I think that everybody's gonna walk away thinking that, yes, I need to continue writing, and I need to put that writing time on my schedule and continue doing that and doing it from the heart. This is something that I, I think a lot, of it, a lot of us maybe will come away with is the idea of writing from the heart, writing about something that we really feel passionate about, something that we care about, and then um, doing it as much as we can and success will come at some point. And having something meaningful to say is something that I think is really crucial um, in what you talked about today. So really appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much and I'll uh, give the floor to Dr. Philback. Great, uh, yes, just echoing Kati's comments. I just want to thank everyone uh, before we close out here. Um, I want to, first of all, thank all the attendees. Uh, we had a great turnout. Uh, you provided some great questions. And Dr. Crash and I know you were speaking most of the time, so I weren't able to appreciate a lot of the comments in the chat pod, but there were a lot of great comments, uh, observations, questions, as well as um, a real appreciation for the points you were making. So thank you to all the participants. 
Uh, also, thank you to our host from 2U. Um, thank you, Katya, my co-moderator, for joining us and helping out with this. And then finally, uh, Dr. Krashen, thanks again for your time, um, your, your uh, pithy insights, and you know, the vast amount of wisdom and experience that you're, that you're able to draw on. So we really appreciate your time. Gosh, thank you. Thank you so much. So with that, we'll uh, sign off. Oh, uh, I have one request. Yeah. I have one request. Follow me on Twitter because I want to catch up to Justin Bieber, who's now up to 20 billion followers, et cetera. Oh, I think he's ahead of Barack Obama. Can you imagine? Okay. Wow. I mean, that's really something. Uh, Katy Perry is number one now, by the way. I keep track of these things. But follow me on Twitter. What I've done on Twitter is announce the new papers as they come out, not just mine, but other people's that I'd like to publicize because I think they're worthwhile. Uh, I do have a website. But if you go to Twitter, you'll be guided there. It's sdcrashen.com. Um, download. Don't ask my permission. Just do it. You may send a copy. You may share it with anyone except Donald Trump. He's not going to read it anyway. Uh, so it's fine. It's okay. This is the future of our work, in my opinion. Free sharing, everyone, all the time. That's how we're going to move forward. Oh, I'm also on ResearchGate. ResearchGate is really cool. You know what they do? They will put your art, no matter where it's published, they'll put it online. People can find your stuff. It's wonderful. So I'm starting to do that more and more. Awesome. Great. So take those leads, um, follow up, and we'll look forward to seeing you all at our next uh, masterclass. So appreciate everyone's participation. Thanks and have a great evening. Thank you Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.